What's up everyone? This is Sir Jem, and for today, we are going to discuss solutions. In the discussion of this lesson, it's very important for us to take note of the following things. Starting with our focus question. How do we classify concentrations of solution? Hmm. Well, later we will see if we'll be able to answer that. Also, we have these learning targets which are expected from you at the end of this lesson. You'll become capable of identifying important properties of solution. Number two, you will be able to explain properties of solution depending on concentration. And lastly, you'll become capable of demonstrating solutions with different concentrations. Also, in this video or in this lesson, we are trying to develop one of the core values of the school which we call motivation. Specifically, you'll become prepared to acquire knowledge and skills to achieve your goals. And second, you'll be very much motivated to succeed in learning. These things we have to remember along the discussion of this lesson. What is the solution for you? Is it the mathematical way of solving a problem? Well, it's different in science. And today, we will see how is it in chemistry. In chemistry, a solution is a system in which one or more substance is homogeneously mixed into another substance. And you heard it right. Homogeneously mixed. Sir, that means... A solution is a mixture? Well, yes. Solutions are a mixture and they are a homogeneous mixture. Because whenever we say solution, there's only one face we can see in it. We cannot see its composition, we cannot see its parts, but only one face of it. Or simple as a mixture of a solute and a solvent. In the picture you can see in this slide, you can see a solvent plus solute means solution. Now, what a solute and a solvent is? Later, we will see as we go further in our discussion. Now, let's see what are the properties of a solution. Firstly, it is a homogeneous mixture of two or more substances. Again, we have said it a while ago already. Whenever we say homogeneous, there's only one phase we can see in it. We cannot see its parts. We cannot see its composition. We cannot identify which is which. Secondly, a solution is composed of a solute and a solvent, which can either be solid, liquid, or gas. Again, whenever we say solution, there should always be a solute and a solvent. Common misconception about solutes and solvent is that Solutes are always solid and solvents are always liquid, but that's wrong. Solutes and solvents can either be solid, liquid, or gas. I want you to remember that. Third, the particles of the solute cannot be seen by the naked eye in a solution. Again, why? Let's go back to what a solution is. A solution is a homogeneous mixture. Therefore, we can only see again one phase of it. We cannot identify where are the solutes and where's the solvent. Commonly, we just see the solvent. The color probably we can see, but we cannot identify where are the particles of its solute. Fourth, the solute in a solution cannot be separated by the use of filtration or by any mechanical means. We cannot manually get it. We cannot, in any way, we cannot use filtration. Why? Because the particles of solutes in a solution are very small to be filtered. Therefore, there should be another process that we should use to separate this mixture. Probably evaporation will do. Fifth, it is composed of only one phase. We just said this a while ago anyway. Whenever we say one phase, 
there's only one physical structure we can see. We cannot identify its parts, but only we view it as one. That's what we mean by one face. A while ago, we have mentioned that a solute and a solvent can either be solid, liquid, or gas. So, this gives us the idea that a solution is not also limited into the liquid phase, but rather, it can also be solid, liquid, or gas. Some examples of a solid solution are steel, which is a mixture of iron, carbon, and other materials. Here, the iron will be serving as the solvent, and the other materials are going to be the solutes. Another one is brass, which is a mixture of copper and zinc. Here, copper is the solvent, and zinc is the solute. And last but not the least, bronze, which is a mixture of copper and tin. Here, copper again is the solvent, and tin was the solute. Then we have the liquid solutions. Well, actually, this is the common type of solution we know, and this is where the misconception comes from. We always think that the solution is always liquid in form, but as you can see here, it's not. Now, some examples of this are salt solution. We mix salt and water. The carbonated drinks we buy and even wines are examples of liquid solutions. One note I want you to remember. In this type of solution, the solvent should always be liquid, but the solute can either be solid or liquid. Sir, how come liquid? Okay, one great example of this is the rubbing alcohol we buy. It's not pure. As you can see in the label, there's percentage indicated. And this means that the alcohol is a mixture of the alcohol itself. Isopropyl, methyl, ethyl, or whatsoever type of alcohol is that. And water. So, water and the alcohol were both liquid. So, this will give us the idea that its solute was a liquid. Later, we will know what, again, is a solute and a solvent. Then, lastly, we have the gas solution. Yes, just like what we have mentioned a while ago, solutions can also be gases. One example, the air we breathe, the air coming from our environment, it's not pure. It's a mixture of a lot of gases, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, and other gases. Again, it is an example of a solution. Now you can see here different pictures. And a while ago, we said that a solution is composed of a solute and a solvent. What I want you to do now is to identify which among these pictures here are solutes, and which are solvent. I will give you 10 seconds. Time is up. Later, we will see if you got the pictures correctly. So, the solutes in the picture a while ago are the salt, the sugar, and the powdered milk. Sir, why them? It's because whenever we are talking about solutes, these are the materials which are being dissolved in a solution, or the materials which are least abundant in a solution. And whenever we say least abundant, it means its amount is less than the solvent. We have two types of solutes the soluble solute, and the insoluble solute. What's the difference between the two? Whenever we say soluble solutes, these are solutes which are being dissolved by a solvent. It can be dissolved. For example, sugar, salt, coffee, powdered milk, and etc. While an insoluble solute are solutes which cannot be dissolved by the solvent. For example, 
sand, paper, oil, rubber, wood, or any material by which when you put it or place it in a solvent, it won't be dissolved. It became possible for a solute to be soluble or insoluble because of the property we call solubility. Solubility is the ability of a substance to be dissolved by another substance. Therefore, the soluble solutes are materials which has the property of solubility, while the insoluble solutes are materials which do not have solubility. That's why they cannot be dissolved by a solvent. If solutes or substances which are being dissolved in a solution, a solvent is the dissolving agent. This is the substance which will dissolve that solute. Also, solvents are the most abundant composition of a solution, meaning to say, its amount is greater than that of the solute. One example, water. And take note, water is considered as the universal solvent. Why? It's because water can dissolve various types of solute. Now, let us perform an experiment. I have here with me three glasses, glass A, glass B, glass C, a pitcher of water, salt, and a spoon. First thing is to put water in our glasses. Probably let's fill half of the glass there. Uh -huh. Glass. There you go. Okay. Then after, I'll be putting salt in it. In glass A, I'll put few salt only, probably quarter of the spoon. There. In the second glass, I'll put half of the spoon. There. It's more than the first one. And here in the third glass, glass C, I'll put one spoon of salt. Now, let's tear each of the glasses. First glass. Then the second glass. And lastly, the third glass. Now, let's observe each of the glasses and see what are the difference in each of these glasses. In the first glass, glass A, if we're going to be looking at it very carefully, let's tear it again. We cannot anymore see salt in this specific solution. Meaning to say, all of the salts we placed in this specific glass got dissolved. In the second glass, same. If we're going to be looking at it, there are no more salts we can see there. Cannot anymore see the salt. Meaning, again, all of it got dissolved. But if we're going to compare these two, which do you think is saltier? Is it A or B? Of course, B. That's correct. It's because we placed more salts in this specific glass. 
for the third glass, if you're gonna be looking at it, there are still salts in it. Meaning to say, not everything got dissolved. There are still solid salts we can see. Now, what's the meaning of this? What do we indicate by these three glasses? We will know later. We have three different types of solution based on concentration. We have the saturated, the unsaturated, and the supersaturated solution. What do we mean by these three? And which among these glasses refers to each of these types of solution? Let's start with the saturated solution. Whenever we are dealing with the saturated solution, these are types of solution which contains the maximum amount of solute that it can dissolve. Again, the maximum amount. Meaning to say, if we are dealing with a saturated solution, if we put more solute in it, it will not anymore be dissolved because it contains already the maximum it can dissolve. So, which among these three is a saturated solution? That's correct. It's glass B. A while ago, we saw that all of the salts got dissolved. But if we are going to be putting more salts here, it will not anymore be dissolved. Let's try it. A while ago, we placed one half of the spoon in our glass B. But let's try to put another half. There. And let's stir it. There. If you're going to be looking at it, there are salts which remain. Meaning to say, it's not anymore saturated because we can see salts which are not yet dissolved. Now, what type of solution is this now? Later, we will know. But again, what you have to remember is that whenever we are talking about saturated solutions, it already contains the maximum solute that it can dissolve. That if we place more solutes in it, it will not anymore be dissolved. Next one is the unsaturated solution. This type of solution contains lesser amount of solute that it can dissolve. Meaning to say, if we put more solutes in it, it can still be dissolved because it does not yet contain the maximum. And I am holding it now. It's glass A. Since this is the glass where we put the least amount of salt, meaning to say it can still dissolve more. Since in glass B a while ago, we placed half spoon, but everything got dissolved. We placed here a quarter of the spoon. Everything got dissolved. Therefore, if we will be putting a half, another quarter, still those will be dissolved. Let's try it. Again, I'll be putting a quarter there, and we are going to mix it. There. If you are going to be looking at this glass, if we stir it, no salts can be seen anymore. Meaning to say, still, all of the salts or, or solute we placed in this glass were dissolved. Again, this proves that glass A a while ago is an unsaturated solution. Then we have the last glass as our supersaturated solution. Why supersaturated? It's because whenever we deal with supersaturated solutions, these are solutions by which the amount of solute contained by the solvent 
was more than the maximum that it can dissolve. Therefore, it cannot anymore dissolve everything since it's more than the maximum. So, if now we are going to be looking at it, still you can see there, there are salts that's not yet melted or rather, which are not yet dissolved. Meaning to say, this proves that this solution is supersaturated. Now, let's go back to the focus question and see if we will be able to answer it. Let's also go back to the learning targets and see if we were able to achieve it. Our focus question was, how do we classify concentrations of a solution? And in this lesson, we were able to realize that for us to classify the concentration of a solution, we have to depend on the amount of solute. If the amount of solute was less than the maximum that could be dissolved, then it's an unsaturated solution. If it contains the maximum that can be dissolved, that's a saturated solution. While if it's more than the maximum, then it's a super saturated solution. Were we able to attain the learning targets we set a while ago? Let's see. Were you able to identify the properties of a solution? Okay, very good. Yes, we were able to do so. We now know that a solution has a solute and a solvent, which can either be solid, liquid, or gas. We now know that the solution is a homogeneous mixture. We now know that solution solute cannot be seen by the naked eye and cannot be filtered. These are some of the properties we talked about a while ago. Can you now explain the properties of solutions depending on concentration? Very good. Yes, we can now explain the properties of solutions depending on concentration. If that's an unsaturated solution, it contains less than the amount of solute that can be dissolved, and everything will be dissolved. If that's a saturated solution, it contains the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved, and again, everything got dissolved. While if that's a super saturated solution, it contains more than the amount of solutes that can be dissolved, and not everything will be dissolved. Can you now demonstrate concentrations of solution? Very good. I know for a fact that you can already demonstrate it by the use of experimentation. And that's our lesson for this week. Again, this is our gem. Goodbye, everyone. See you again next time.